I'm Azania Musaka and welcome to Real Talk. How many times have you heard about how men and women have been placed on this earth to procreate? The fairy tale ending for a little girl is to one day find their Prince Charming, marry him and start a beautiful family, right? Well, not entirely true because more and more women these days are deciding very early on in their lives that motherhood is not for them. And today we'll be hearing from several such women as we learn about the reasons motivating their decision. We'll also get into the often negative reaction that they dealt with from friends, family and society in general. Sizagele Murukule is a highly successful entrepreneur and an academic whose PhD thesis focuses precisely on this topic and she joins me now on the show. Siza, you are my woman crush. I'm so happy <laughs> that you are here as we discuss this question of deciding not to have children. Thank you for having me. But I want us to get the terminology right because there is a difference between child-free and childless. Yes. So explain to me, why, what is the choice and why these definitions? Be so the reason, firstly, let's talk about why the definitions are important, right? They're important because we have to call things by their proper name. In the same way that we don't say a spade is a garden tool, right? Um, the, the universe of women without children is not a homogenous one. Yes. So people who are childless, by definition, are people who would love to have, but due to circumstance are unable to have. And then people who are child-free, like me, mm -hmm. are people who have made the free choice not to procreate. So the faster we as society can start managing that distinction, yeah. the faster we'll deepen our understanding of this community of women who don't have children. Right. So let's now look at what that can be associated to. When people say free, it suggests that perhaps you don't want the burden of having children. Do you get that kind of feedback, that backlash about the choice of free yeah and the and the, yeah so people say oh this sounds so light like sugar free yeah. right like <laughs> <laughs> fat, free. fat free like no that's not it mm. and of course the the emphasis on the free is about the freedom not necessarily the absence of yes. right so many of the women that we had an opportunity to to speak to were very clear that this, this the choice is made because you're choosing life you're walking away from motherhood so it's not a it's not a a childish thing to, to do, it's not even a selfish thing to do, it's actually a very conscious decision to make. So that freedom is just about an exercising one's right. right. And that's where the, the sense of being child-free comes from. Let's explore your own background, yes. because at the age of 12, your parents got divorced. Yes. And I think for any child, that can be a very painful and traumatic experience. Do you think that this is where part of this decision was first born? For me, I remember the, that experience being very traumatic, mm -hmm. right? But also in my own little mind, I figured out that relationships are impermanent, but children are permanent, mm. right? So you, there's, there's a likelihood that I'll get a relationship wrong, but I, I wouldn't want to get raising a child wrong. So that decision for me came from that age. And then as my, my worldview grew and I read up on books and I met other women who were solid in their choice and they were okay, they weren't limping because they didn't have children. I'm like, okay, this is a thing that can be done. But I do remember precisely being young and making that decision. Mm. Yeah. So when were you able to separate the two, that this wasn't because of the pain, that this is actually how you felt? Uh, as I got older, because I'd watch, I'd watch people or even my friends would say things like they've got a, they've got a, um, a baby rush or they've got a... Being a, broody. A, a, yeah, no, 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 broody don't know. Like, I, I promise you, I, I probably must have been broody once in one relationship for all of three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and the thought was gone. And the minute, uh, because you, you see a chubby baby, right? Mm -hmm. And it's well behaved and you think, oh, I could have one of those, and then it screams. You're like, mm, I back don't to your want senses. One of those. No, no, back no, to your senses. Yeah, yeah. But how do you feel about children? Because one would think you made this decision because you hate children. I don't pinch them, just so to be clear, <laughs> unless we're arguing over whatever's <laughs> left over of watermelon. That's the only time I pinch <laughs> children: watermelon and marshmallows. But otherwise, I love them. I am godmother to three, and this is the other thing: is that when when we have a conversation with women who are child-free. 
society almost makes me feel like I must justify in what ways I'm not harmful to children, right? Mm. So it is, I don't have children, they go, mm, then I feel like I have to say, but I've got, got children. I'm like, no, I'm past that. I don't have children, full stop. Yeah, you yeah. have, I don't have, it's fantastic, let's have a glass of wine, let's keep it moving. Yeah. So no, the, the experience we've found is that it's not a dislike of children. It's just the awareness that children are not a choice I want to write into my life story. Let's talk about relationships because uh, you want to be with someone. People want a companion, a witness to their life. You were married for 15 years. Yes. Did the thought ever come into the conversation? You know, at some point, you know, people probably expect that you'll change your mind or that something will happen. You find the right man and then you will come to want to have children. <laughs> Okay, so I was in a relationship for 15 years and married inside that relationship, so yes. just at what correction. But when we met, um, it was clear to him that I didn't want children, right? Uh, and he wasn't the sort of person who was going to try and convert you to seeing the Lord's view with children, so that didn't happen. Yeah. But c after my divorce, I have come across male people who, <laughs> in a very interesting way, have taken upon themselves to prove to me that I actually must be a mother. You yeah. know, so it's like, no, you've never found the right man. I'm the man who's going to show you and unlock your mothering gene because mm. clearly all the other buggers haven't been able to do, <laughs> haven't been able to do this. So, so it's a it's a conversation I have very early on, particularly when I feel like I like you a lot. I, I put it out there so that we don't waste each other's time. Yes. Um, and those who linger, linger with the hope of, of, of converting me, mm. right? Which gets annoying because it reinforces this idea that a woman can't make a decision until a man affirms that decision, yes. right? So it bugs me because you're smart, you, you're well-traveled, you are successful at work, you are a conscious human being at least, and then you present this traditional view that says, I will tell you mm -hmm. and I will remind you of your duty that as a woman, that is what you're supposed to do. What's been the reaction from family, from friends, from broader society? Because even in the language that we have, we attach very negative words to a woman who doesn't have children. Firstly, our society still conflates motherhood and womanhood, mm -hmm. right? And that's important to separate. I am no less a woman because I'm not a mother. Mm -hmm. So those are two things we need to separate. The second one is we also need to be very clear that motherhood is not about the ability to procreate. It's not also about your financial abilities. It's about the conscious responsibility you have to raise another human being. Yeah. And I don't take that lightly. So when I'm surrounded by people who at weddings, you've heard these songs. I'm like, the world. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and a fridge full of champagne. I can, there is a lot of stuff I can rattle off for you, but there is something intentionally hurtful mm -hmm. in how women without children are treated. And, and my, com my sympathy goes out to those of us who would like to have children but can't, because it's a really painful thing. It's like somebody saying to me, um, you should be dark. I'm like, I'm yellow. What mm -hmm. else do you want me to do? So I do think that there's a, a sensitivity gene missing somewhere. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, I chal and I do challenge women in particular because the most judgment I have experienced has been from black mothers. Right. What yes. do they say? Because the first thing is, why would you not have children? No, because I don't want them. That's so selfish. I'm like, I don't know you. We've just met. Mm. We had a play date. Mm. Be nice. You know? Or... Um, or you must be gay mm -hmm. because that's why you don't have children. I'm like, actually, my sexuality is not a thing I'm going to discuss with you, but no, that's not the reason. So, so people find other things to try and affirm to themselves that the choice you've made yes. can't be correct because they've made other choices. So you've gone around, of course, doing your PhD thesis. Yes. Why did you choose to focus particularly on black women? One, because uh, the, the title is actually called Fighting Erasure, right? Mm -hmm. Because... As I know, the study that I'm doing is the first of its kind on the continent, um, Very as far as I'm aware, work. to tell the story. Because I would love for little boys and little girls to grow up knowing that it's okay for the woman you will marry if that's what you choose. Mm -hmm. If she doesn't want kids, it's okay. It's also okay for a young black child to grow up knowing that her value to society isn't diminished because she's not a mother. Yes. Yeah. And what about the 
I'm sure you've heard this notion that this is a foreign thing, that you are, um, you, you are now falling into the trap of adopting a Western notion, um, that this pushback about feminism, that you're being ultra excessive in your feminism. Or, or and that or that have been colonized because yeah. I remember because I, I remember uh, I was on one radio station trying to recruit respondents and a father called and said he can tell from my accent that I spend too much time around white people because what I'm talking about is not African he's got three daughters and they are going to give him grandchildren hmm. and my heart broke but I also said to him sir you are the reason why I'm doing this work so that your daughters hopefully can read this body of work and be presented with choice. Absolutely. Yeah. The role of patriarchy, religion, and I'm sure it's quite pronounced. But also this. even 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 medicine, right? I was saying to somebody earlier, I would go to doctors and they'd say to me, you're 32, when are you going to start having children? I'm like, I'm not interested. So I fired three gynecologists. I'm like, I'm, I don't come here <laughs> to find a father. I came here for some medical help. Advice. So, let's, yeah, so yeah. let's just leave it. So you've got, you've got the spiritual value that's been attached to children, right? which is somewhere in the Bible, God said something about multiply. So someone will use that. And then there's that economic thing, which is when I have children, they'll look after me. And then there's that psychological thing, which is when I have children, I will be fulfilled. So proponents of pronatalism insist that these are the reasons why every girl's destination should be motherhood. And yes. I'm suggesting that every girl's destination is a destination she has the freedom to choose. And I'm hoping that a lot more girls will live in societies where they can make this choice freely. And from the respondents that you've had, have you found that this cuts right across class, right across backgrounds, uh, especially with the group of black women you've interacted with? I've also found that there's a key relationship between present fathers and daughters who turn out to feel that they can make this choice. So three of the seven respondents said that their fathers affirmed them from an early age. Mm -hmm. They said you can be anything you want to be. So that's the first. And the second one was they were raised in families where the relationships were egalitarian. The father would make tea for mom. He would get slippers for her. So, so she grew up with an example that says this is what people do in a relationship. Yeah. They partner and they respect one another. So we looked at how these thoughts came up for you as a young child. Yeah. But for many of the respondents, well, what was the catalyst? Is there, is there a particular category of reasons or commonality that you're seeing? Some, some people had had, had uh, oopsies and they decided with the oopsie that, oh my goodness, I actually don't want to do this thing. Yeah. So one is I'll dispense of the oopsie, but post that, I actually know that ch children is not what I want in my future. For someone else, it was about understanding how the responsibility of raising kids would mm -hmm. have meant making sacrifices for a um, a travel around the world or getting to be an entrepreneur because here let's tell the truth yeah. the life I live would be truly truly stressful if I had a little person to look after because mm. what happens on the days I don't get paid mm. it needs to be fed right mm. so so sh one person was very clear that they would want to be entrepreneurial in their lives and therefore r raising a kid in that right. environment would not have been fair yeah so there's so there's there's a lot of thought that goes into this it's not it's not somebody waking up and saying it's a fashionable thing so how about we make this thing happen mm -hmm. no mm -hmm. because the the trauma and the stigma we face is so intense that no sane person would willingly yes. walk into this thing, yes, right? Yes, and wakes yeah. up and say, my, me, yes. me, yes. I yes. want to yes. walk this hard road. Yeah. And then the question of legacy, because we attach what, we, what legacy means to us, to our children and how they turn out, uh, and this idea of continuing the name. How have you then defined your legacy, or how do you respond to that question? I, I think we start off by assuming that all children turn out okay, Yeah. right? And I'd love to suggest that every one of us, every family has got that one person who's just not okay. So what happens if that person's part of your legacy? So in my instance, my life's work mm -hmm. is my legacy. Mm -hmm. And the people whose lives I've touched will then carry on whatever aspect of positive influence they may have benefited from. I can't wait for it to be completed because it's going to provide amazing insights. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Well, a big thank you to Sizagele Murukule for sharing her experience and her fascinating work with us. And more often than not, women who never want to become mothers get told that 
a couple of things in fact like you'll change your mind when the right man comes along well for our next guest she's 29 years old and she says it doesn't matter which man comes along she will never change her mind on the fact that she doesn't want to carry children we'll talk to her next So when are you getting married? When are you going to have children? When are you going to make me a grandmother? All of these are questions that most women have dealt with at least once in their lives. But what happens if you want none of these things for yourself? Well, society often feels that uh, they owe that we they, they owed an explanation because you are seen to be deviating from your purpose as a woman. We now welcome 29-year-old Palisa Mpato, who is a social media and online engagement banker. Palisa, thank you for being here. Hi, thank you. So you were listening in to what Tizagela had to say. She talked about how her decision to be child-free was really brought about from a childhood pain, yeah. childful, a, a childhood painful experience. So what brought on this decision for you? Um, I think there's lots of factors. Um, so when I was young, I was in a long-term relationship, I guess, at that age. I'm not sure you can call it long-term. Yeah. Um, and I felt pregnant and I was excited. Yay, great. I was about 19 at the time. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I miscarried. Mm. So that was the first thing. I was just like, first of all, divine intervention. Wow. Um, because it was just the relationship wasn't good, not good age, not good time, not good relationship. It just wasn't the mm -hmm. right thing. Mm -hmm. um, but after that, I then realized that there was a lot of factors. First of all, the person you're going to have a child with. Um, I have bipolar. Mm -hmm. That's hereditary. You never know when it skips the gene or when it comes through. That's a big factor for me. Um, the world is a scary place. Yeah. Um, for adults, for children. I'm st what if I am raising a rapist or a child who's going to be raped? I don't know how I'd handle that, mm. let alone how they'd handle that. Um, yeah, so along the years, there's been more things that just make me think, no, thank you. This is not, what, this is not yeah, for you. Yeah. But was there ever a time when you did feel that excitement? I think when I was pregnant at 19. You did? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think that's, yeah. You could see yourself I as could, a mother. Because as, as like a teenager growing up, it wasn't exactly the, oh, let's have babies. The idea of marriage and stuff was great. But I don't think I really thought too hard about babies until that was happening. Yeah. Mm. And as you say, that kind of took a toll on you, mm. your mental health. Yeah. Because you were soon diagnosed with, uh, with bipolar. Yes. So, and then to have to make this decision. So mentally, it's been quite a journey. Definitely. Mm. Definitely. What are some of the things that you've had to contend with in that process? Um, I think just being able to understand why I don't want kids. Because lots of times people are like, no, it's such a gift. Um, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. And look. Yes, guys, great. Kids are fantastic. Yeah. I get it. It's just, I, I have meltdowns. So I find it difficult to look after myself with bipolar, with being an adult just in life. No, adulting is hard. I think it's a real will tell thing. So, um, yeah, just taking a look back and being like, look, having a kid isn't going to work out for me. Mm. I have days where I can't get out of bed for me, I can't get out of bed for another human being. Yes. Um, and then, uh, like your last guest said, there's black parents, black mothers, even black fathers asking why it's such a blessing. Your you're being family selfish. Reacted? My mom, when I told her I was coming to the show, first of all, I think she cringed because I couldn't see her face to face. Yeah. She's like, you're going to tell the whole world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, she laughed. Mm -hmm. Then she was like, why? But she, these are, we have this conversation all the time and these are the stages. Laugh, why? And I'm sad I'm not going to have grandkids and then why again? And then, oh, maybe you'll rethink it. Mm. Do you find people always trying to change your mind? Yeah, Persuade definitely. you? Yeah, I think because also not a lot of people, you don't get into conversation of how old are you before you usually get to these things. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of people will be like, oh, when you get older, you'll change your mind. And I'm just like, mm. That body clock. Because often <laughs> women are perceived to be driven by yeah. that body clock. Yeah. You know, this window of opportunity for you to have children. And if yeah. you miss it, yeah. you're missing out on this thing. Uh, and that's... It can be a misconception. It's a huge misconception. Um, I have so many friends with kids. I think I'm doing just fine. Like if I hang out with them for long enough, I'm going to see all those steps yes. of a child not missing out on anything. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, so I don't, it's just, it sucks that people say that because then you're just like, what am I doing with myself? Mm -hmm. Because I don't have a child. Then you see other people with babies. So it makes you doubt yourself. It does, but I mean, it doesn't make myself doubt myself to a point where I'm like, maybe it's just, yeah, it's being human, I guess. Yes. You, you wonder. I can imagine how difficult yeah. you've made this firm decision mm. and constantly trying, or, or people always trying yeah. to make you deviate from yeah. it and having to defend yourself well, constantly. Tell you, yeah, tell you you don't know what you're, what you're thinking or what you're, the decision you're making. That's mm -hmm. not, yeah. Yeah. So relationships, how do you navigate through those considering this decision? When do you decide to tell, say, a new partner that this is how you want to go through life? I don't think I've come to a stage where it's, it, I've been in a relationship where we've had to discuss that. Okay. Um, but, but would it be a deal breaker? It would. It definitely would and um, it's because I don't think it would be fair for me to be mm. with somebody who wants to have kids. Out of pure love, it's the right thing to do is then let them find somebody who wants to have kids because I'm not going to change my mind. Mm -hmm. And you clearly want kids in the hopes that it will make you happy and I'm not going to make you happy in that sense. Yeah. And yeah, I don't want somebody to be resentful after we've been together for many, many years. I also don't want to marry you. So this could be very awkward. I don't know, that kind of guy would just have to be very happy with like <laughs> a lot of things that I don't want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So has it made it difficult then to get into or to find a relationship? I think so. Are you dating? No. Okay. I'm not. <laughs> no, because often with a deal breaker, it's very clear. Mm. You you have it very clear, but when you put your cards on the table, yeah. uh, other people initially might agree, like Cizakelo was saying. Exactly. People agree with the hope that at some point You'll their love mm. or how you are together will, will persuade you. My love will tell you to go away. <laughs> That's, okay. it's That's a tweetable quote. I swear, I'm just like, do this for the both of us, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's exhausting. It is, it is. Sure. I just want everyone to be happy. So like, have kids, I don't want them. Mm. Yeah. And medically, have you considered options? Um, in terms of maybe freezing my eggs or no. What I have considered though, and been looking into recently, is tying my tubes or a hysterectomy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, that's another discussion where my mother is just like, you'll change your mind. That's such a permanent thing. Um, then looking at that. But in terms of freezing eggs, I really, really don't want to. I re it's a just thing. If I change my mind, I will adopt. Yes, yes. So There's you're willing to? If at some point I feel like a child is something I'm yearning for, mm -hmm. then I will adopt. Go the adoption route. Uncles, aunts, grandparents, her, the extended family. Do you come under a lot of pressure always having to justify? I'm very good at like brushing things off, like mm -hmm. giggling them off and then just being like cool. Otherwise it's going to be a conversation that's never ending mm -hmm. and they're not going to understand and I'm not going to like turn back on my word and it's just going to be awkward for everyone. So yes, just, you know. yes, but there might come a time where you have to have quite a definitive response that says beyond, I'm not talking to you about this beyond this. That's usually it, but everyone thinks I'm joking. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I can see it on your I'm face, not. actually. <laughs> that you're not yeah. delusional about yeah. this at all. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much. I thank think it you. takes a lot of courage. Mm -hmm. And I hope your mom is okay with the details that you've divulged <laughs> with us today. If, um, she asked if she can call in so she can be like, this is ridiculous. I was like, don't do that. Yes. You'll talk about it later. <laughs> yeah. You'll talk about it later. Palisa, thank cool. you. Thank you. Well, we're saying goodbye to Palisa Mpato. And after the break, we meet a woman who's been married eight years to her husband, where both of them are quite happy to live out the rest of their lives together without children. But what happens when Afrikaans tradition clashes with your decision to not carry the family name? We find out from Cindy Straight on next. October 2017 saw American talk show host Jeannie Meyer make a tough call to end her marriage of 10 years with her ex-husband Freddie Harties. The reason? 
Jeannie and her husband had been having disagreements about whether or not to have children. Jeannie had always known she didn't want to, but Freddie couldn't see a future without, without someone to carry on his family name. This is just one example of what can happen in extreme cases of when married couples have opposing views about children. My next guest, however, says it's a lot easier for her seeing as how both her and her husband are on the same page about not growing their family. We welcome clinical psychologist Cindy Stradom to Real Talk. Cindy, Thank great you. to have you here. Thanks for having me. So you and your husband have been married for eight years, right? Almost and eight, yes. Almost eight. Mm -hmm. And the two of you feel the same about not having children. Mm -hmm. Was this a conversation you had while you were dating or after you got married? When did you first discover that you shared this, um, this view? I honestly can't remember. I think it was such a natural conversation when talking about life in general, what we want from life, that there's not a significant moment that I can go like, well, that was the definitive moment of saying, we want kids, we don't want kids. And I mean, it's a continuous discussion to mm -hmm. make sure we're on the same page still. Yes. But it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't something that was this defining moment in our relationship. Well, according to research, uh, women, white women particularly, are the ones that are most found to be child-free or to mm -hmm. make that decision to be child-free. But increasingly, we're finding this choice in other groups as well. The US, uh, based on this research, it says Hispanic women as well as Asian women mm -hmm. are increasingly making this decision. You heard what Valesa and Cisagela had to say earlier about their experience within the black community. Mm -hmm. how, how has it been in the white community for you? Um, honestly, I think that I don't necessarily know. I've always been somebody who knows what I want, so I don't really bother too much about society pressures, mm -hmm. ideas. Obviously get it to an extent, you know, um, the weddings, the baby showers, you know, um, my nephew's christening, for example, yeah. you know, had a comment about, so your younger sister's got a child now, when are you having a child, mm. kind of thing. But, you know, I take it on my stride and, you know, I do think that women generally feel more empowered to make this decision. So we've learned how to, how to deal with the comments, how to deal with the questions about it. And how not do you deal with them? What do you say? Uh, sometimes it's just like a, a small remark. So I think my go-to answer often is we've got dogs in the house and we call them the kids. So people say, do you have kids? I'm like, yep, two dogs. And that's They're the, the kids the in the house. End of the story. But um, it all depends. I mean... You sometimes get questions, especially with my nephew, he's a year and a half now, kind of going, oh, are you practicing when you're babysitting? No, I'm not practicing, I'm babysitting. <laughs> so it is just about kind of letting people know straight off that, you know, it's not really up for discussion. Right. And then you're married into an Afrikaans family. Yes. Uh, and Afrikaans families can often be conservative. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the opinions from that side? Um, I think they keep their opinions mostly for themselves because mm -hmm. they do know that I'm a little strong-willed. So... They, I don't get too many comments. I mean, my husband and I have been together for 13 years already, so like they've had to learn over the years that it's not really something that we're going to entertain mm -hmm. about their opinions. I'm sure they secretly want like a horde of grandkids, but you know, our families are, well, my family specifically is very supportive of it. I think my mom fights my battles for me wow. very often. Wow. But um, generally, you know, yes, there's an Afrikaans idea about having kids, carrying over the name. I think in most cultures it's that way. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it hasn't been something that's affected me. It hasn't been something that affected my marriage. And your relationship with your in-laws, clearly. Yeah. But do you find that then this decision for a couple not to have children mm -hmm. is laid at the doorstep of the woman more than the man? I do think so. I think that it's kind of, you know, she decided not to have kids, not it was a joint decision in that way. And I mean, my husband and I have always been honest. If we change our mind one day, we'll have an honest conversation between the two of us and make a decision between the two of us. Yes. But it's not necessarily that it's got to do with anybody else. So, you know, their opinions actually don't matter too much. Right. So let me ask you to put your psychologist hat on mm -hmm. then. If you had to counsel a couple, they come to mm -hmm. you and say one person in the relationship is happy to remain child free mm -hmm. and the other person now wants children, what would your advice be to them? Yeah. So it's obviously going to be a bit of therapy that has got to go into mm -hmm. it. You would have to decide, you know, why each person is making the decision at that point in time, how important it is for them, whether it's a deal breaker or not, how much give and take. I mean, relationships are filled with decisions that we make that are vitally important. Obviously, having kids is one of those vital um, decisions we've got to make. But 
you know, it's really about kind of saying like, is this something we can compromise on? Is it not something we can compromise on? And unfortunately, if it's that we're, you know, we're at different ends, there's no way of us yes, meeting. it's like an impasse, like I mentioned with Jeannie Mai's yes. story. So, and then it might be that, you know, we'd have to call it quits on the relationship and rather pursue a relationship that give us what we want. Mm -hmm. So it's always it's a very difficult call. thing. It is. And it's difficult for couples to make those decisions. But in the end, a person has to be true to yourself. You've got to know what you can live with. Mm -hmm. You know, do you really want to give in and have a child and you're going to land up regretting that? Yes. Are you going to land up having to raise a child and a child that you don't want? Yeah. So, you know, rather be honest with yourself, rather, you know, kind of, I'm going to say, look inwardly, really connect with yourself, know whether it's something you can do or can't do. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure people would love a child if they're there, you know, but I do think that a person has to be okay with the life they've chosen, the life that they're living. See, that's why I find your decision with your husband also quite interesting because mm -hmm. you have, you agree, but mm -hmm. also acknowledge that one day, if either one of you woke up and decided that actually... I can't see the rest of my life without children. You would have the conversation. Yes. But that means also being prepared potentially for an impasse of sorts. Mm. And yeah, deciding then if I have to wake up and want kids and he doesn't want kids, then, you know, do I choose my marriage or do I choose my need to have kids? Mm -hmm. That's a tough choice. It would be. Almost but impossible. I, people make tough choices all the time. So yeah. it would be possible to make that choice and just to decide. and then live with your choice. Mm. You know, you can't then blame the other person because you've made a choice to stay yeah. with them. So if you have a patient, for instance, who comes mm. to you having spent the majority of their life child-free, mm. and then they present with feelings of regret, mm. how should we navigate that when we realize perhaps we made the wrong decision in our younger years? Yeah. Any regrets we have would mean that there's a bit of an emotional grieving process that we've got to go through. We've got to process it and resolve it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I mean, life isn't necessarily the easiest thing. So the chances of any of us, of us getting through life with no regrets at all, that's probably not going to happen. Right. right. So in the same way, we all need to be able to deal with those regrets. And, you know... I think if you, you stay true to yourself throughout your life, then at least if you get to whatever age, 60, and think, you know what, maybe it would have been nice, mm. you can mm. at least fall back to that, you know, at any point in time during my life, I was at least honest with myself. So I knew that I made the right decision at 30, at 40, at 20, at whatever the case was. Yes. And then for younger women, mm -hmm. I imagine, uh, go back to the conversation that I just had with Valesa, mm -hmm. who, who seems very firm on her decision mm -hmm. to be child free. Is there also emotional work that needs to happen during that period? It would all depend on the individual and whether or not the person feels like there's some form of conflict within themselves yeah. about making this decision. Yeah. Maybe it's even just skill work that needs to get done of how do I enforce this in life and not necessarily feel guilty about you know, other people's comments, other people's ideas, you know, a mom that desperately wants a grandchild, but, mm. you know, you're the only one that can give it to them. Mm. So a lot of the work that might need to get done is not necessarily about the choice itself, but navigating the choice through life. Absolutely, because that conflict is ever present. Mm -hmm. Those feelings of guilt are ever present. Yes. And society works so hard to almost shame you mm. for the choice that you've made. But the interesting thing about guilt is guilt is the feeling we feel when we break our own rules. So if you're feeling guilt, it means that you feel like you've broken something for yourself, not necessarily somebody else's rule for yours. So that would have to be dealt through through therapy as well, about what about your own rule did you now break yes. that you're living with, oh, I should give my mom a grandchild, for example. I love that. I love that because it provides so much clarity mm -hmm. about how then we approach these feelings of guilt because it takes us back to our own rules and our own yes. principles, as you say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cindy. Pleasure. It was absolutely fascinating. I want to thank clinical psychologist Cindy Stradom for being here with us. But coming up next, in, in the event that you've decided motherhood is not on the cards for you, what kind of medical options are available to you? Well, gynecologist and obstetrician Dr. Cassandra Letitia Pele has the answers after the break. Stay with us.
Welcome back. You're with Real Talk on SABC3. The stage is yours. I'm a 33-year-old and want a hysterectomy. I'm not too young to decide that I don't want children, end quote. These were the words that grabbed attentions and made headlines, stated by a News24 journalist who goes on to say that people should stop policing other women's decisions when it involves their uteruses. But if there's one profession that knows all about the ins and outs of our wombs, it's gynecologists and obstetricians. We welcome now to Real Talk, Dr. Cassandra Letitia Pele to hear her insights. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Right off the bat, this is an interesting one, right? Completely. Especially when you bring in the medical aspect of it. So sure. we need to look at the options uh, because you heard from the women that we had on the couch previously. And so often when you've made this decision, you've got to do a really good job at making sure that pregnancy doesn't happen. Of course. I think many patients or people or women, when they've come to that realization, want to probably take the um, step in... Um, affirming that they definitely are not going to fall pregnant. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to ask yourself, you know, what step would that be and how drastic would those measures be? Yes. Yeah. There are a few options available. Let's start with one of the most common ones, the pill. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we're told it's okay for women. Sometimes we're told that there are serious consequences. Where do you stand? I think with the pill, it is a very good contraceptive method, very easily available to most people. Um, method that you choose would be very compatible to the way the person would be using it. So if you are a good pill taker and you are using it correctly, it would provide great contraceptive method for you. Mm -hmm. The other thing one should um, remember is that every woman should be individualized. So not a, every pill would work for each woman. Yes. You've got to look into medical history. You've got to look at risks associated with taking a pill or not. And I think the big risk that we, um, many uh, women come to us with is the risk of deep vein thrombosis and clots um, in the legs, emboli, uh, clots in the lungs. Right. So if you're individualizing your patient, you would not give a patient who has a risk of developing such um, conditions the combined contraceptive pill, and you would look at other options that are less risky or better suited to them. Mm. And then the option of sterilization, there's the non-surgical and the surgical options. Mm -hmm. Just break those down for me. Okay, so if you're looking at um, sterilization, we're looking at tubal occlusion. Um, it's a surgical procedure in which um, the fallopian tubes are occluded. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're doing it surgically, you are looking at uh, placing either a clip, which is a Fulci clip, um, onto that tube, and we do it laparoscopically. So most people refer to that as keyhole surgery or minimally invasive surgery. Right, yes. Um, or you can look at um, removing the tube, fallopian tube completely, which is a salpingectomy or rings on the tube. So those are the um, surgical options in terms which of sterilization. So you've got to look at what uh, was performed before. If you have a clip on the tube, um, most of those would be reversible. You've got to look into what is the success of uh, reversing the sterilization. So if you have uh, a patient, you've got to look at her medical history, you've got to look at any previous pelvic inflammatory diseases. If she's just had a clip on, it entails microsurgery. So mm -hmm. not all gynecologists are doing that. Um, fertility specialists might be looking um, at doing those type of procedures. Yeah. And you've got to look at risks associated with it. So you've got a success rate probably ranging from 10 to 80%, depending on the type of tubal occlusion that was performed. Um, you've got to look at the risks of a possible ectopic pregnancy. So wow. should that procedure have uh, been performed, a mm -hmm. reversal of um, sterilization or tubal occlusion, did that tube heal? Is it patent? Would a possible pregnancy now um, mm. get stuck in that tube and cause an ectopic pregnancy, yes. which is outside the uterus? And that becomes uh, you know, a medical risk to the patient. Uh, I shared the story of a News24 journalist who talked about wanting a hysterectomy at the age of 33. Mm. So when would that ever be an option for a woman? Because so often women are deterred from mm. doing hysterectomies below a particular age. So hysterectomy is actually not a procedure that we would do specifically for women looking for contraceptive uh, issues or a permanent form of not falling pregnant. So what if you I would look at a sterilization. <laughs> A hundred and a thousand percent sure. So I think you're looking at no womb, no baby, basically. Um, if you're looking at um, sterilization or a tubal occlusion, that would be an indication. If you're doing a hysterectomy, there are medical risks associated with the procedure. So a hysterectomy, in a sense, is not an elective procedure, not just to have um, children or to be 
become pregnant, you're looking at risks of um, procedure being open or laparoscopic, risks to bowel injury, bladder injury, mm. ureteric injury. There could be uh, times where there could be um, decreased blood supply to your ovary and that could allow menopause to basically start or, or symptoms to become um, evident earlier than what it would have. So I think if you're looking at risks of surgery for what you actually need, a hysterectomy is not actually ideal for Who the purpose. Who would be an ideal candidate then? For a hysterectomy, you need to have a medical condition with pathology in the uterus. So people who have, for example, abnormal cervical cells, pre-cancer um, cervical um, changes, um, cervix cancer in the early stages would have a hysterectomy, mm. um, conditions like fibroids or myomas that cause abnormal heavy bleeding, mm -hmm. they would be entitled to have hysterectomies so and have cancer. Hysterectomy. So not an elective hysterectomy, is it? Yeah, unfortunately not. Mm. No, I'm thinking on the side or uh, expressing empathy for women who might really want to shore up the fact that they don't want to have children. This I definitive think choice that their bodies simply wouldn't be able to do it. If you're removing the whole tube, that has a decreased risk as there could be possible um, recanalization with a tubal occlusion procedure. If you remove the entire fallopian tube, you pretty much have zero chance of falling pregnant. So as a doctor, as a medical doctor, there's also a level of information, what I would call counseling in the mm. rooms that takes place. What do, how do you feel about how society deals with women who've chosen to be child-free? So after hearing um, all our speakers, do you know, it seems like that a lot of thought has gone into that from a very young age. So I would say if I have a patient that comes to me and has thought about this for many years, yeah. it's not a decision that they're taking lightly. So I think a woman is entitled to their opinion and to how they feel about being child free. Mm. And if you're looking at uh, mm, treating or providing options for them, and they would want to have, um, for example, mm -hmm. a sterilization or any other form of long acting um, contraceptive method on board, then we should be empathetic to be able to allow them to have yes. that. And so much of reproductive health is about choice, it's yes. about giving women those options. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Pele. You're welcome. Thank well, a big you. thank you to all of my guests. It's just been so insightful. From Sizagele Murukule to Palisam Pato, Cindy Stradom, and of course, Dr. Cassandra Pele. Have a good weekend ahead, and we will see you again on Monday. Right now, though, Isidingo is up next. Thank you for watching.